Well, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is, I'm Morton Blackwell. It's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this, our October Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. We have a, uh, a very important and timely uh, presentation here. Um, I, uh, I, I want to take an, an opportunity because we have uh, a hero among us. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's the guest of Al Pierce, and I'm going to ask Al to come up and introduce him. Al? Just so you Good morning. You will find somewhere on the table a little piece of paper that uh, is an article from the Washington Post. I'm not very often going to recommend a Washington Post article to you, but this one you, you might want to read at your leisure. It's quite a few pages, so I know you haven't read it yet this morning, but it's an article about uh, a young Marine who had a change in his mission in Afghanistan and took charge and is quite a hero, at least in my opinion. I got the pleasure to meet him pretty recently. And I heard from he and a friend of his that he had an interest in getting involved in politics, conservative politics. and. Could we give him a, a step in the right direction to get there? And I thought of no better place than the Leadership Institute. You're here. So, <laughs> and then as my Christian God gave me the power to make that even better, a week or two ago at the free lunch we had here, there was a door prize, which I happened to win. <laughs> All right. And it was one of the workshops here. And I said, I know where this should go. So I'm giving that workshop to Arthur Carell. Arthur, would you come up, please? My hero. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Arthur Carell. Good morning, everybody. This is highly unexpected, so I'll keep it short and sweet. I mean, I uh, thank Mr. Pierce and uh, all y'all for having me here. Uh, really, the article should be about my Marines, and uh, that's what it's about. That's what they did, and uh, I'm here because they're because they were there. So, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm looking very much forward to the talk, and thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, Captain Carell. Well, we, we certainly live in interesting times. I uh, heard on the news this morning that President Obama is going to be installing solar panels on the roof of the White House. <coughs> that is obviously a very good political move. It works so well for Jimmy Carter. <laughs> the Leadership Institute has Thus far this year, trained 7,049 students. And since 1979, the total we have trained is 90,623. You have before you a, a current 2010 school schedule. I urge you to take uh, a moment and review our upcoming schools and consider attending one of them or sending uh, a friend. Now my pleasure is to introduce Amanda Prevet. She will offer an invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Amanda is a regional field coordinator here at the Leadership Institute. She graduated from Elon University in uh, 2009 uh, and earned a BA in Anthropology. Amanda? please bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here safely. Bless this food and bless our time together this morning. Amen. I feel
you'll please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, and now I present to you Tyler Foote. He's going to give us a report on the Institute's programs. Tyler is a political training coordinator here at the Leadership Institute. He was previously an event coordinator at Eventualities Incorporated in Louisville, Kentucky. He graduated from Center College in Kentucky in 2009, where he double majored in political science and history. Tyler? Thank you, Morton, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Morton stole a little bit of my thunder with uh, his program's report, but um, I want to take a second and repeat those numbers simply because they are pretty amazing. Uh, 2010 has been an exciting year for the Leadership Institute. With a little over a few months left to go in the, in the remaining in the year, we've trained nearly 7,000 conservative activists, helped place 73 job seekers through conservativejobs.com, and launched a brand new online training with teapartytraining.org. Overall, as Morton has already said, we've trained over 87,000 uh, political activists since 1979. So like I said, those are pretty impressive numbers and definitely warrant uh, repeating. I would like to take a moment and highlight a few of the schools led by the Department of Political Training. Uh, since our last breakfast in September, the Department of Political Training has completed two phenomenal events, the Legislative Project Management School and our inaugural free lunch panel series. The Legislative Project Management School is designed to give activists the tools, to, uh, the tools necessary to pass effective pieces of legislation while working to defeat bad ones. We were fortunate enough to be joined by Paul Conway of the Conway Group, Ed Hickey of Elmelvany and Myers, and Kurt Schmatz of the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee. We were pleased to welcome 42 students to this training as it was the largest legislative project management school in seven years. We also held our inaugural free lunch panel series on September 23rd. Our goal was to add an intellectual component to our political technology-based trainings. 64 guests arrived as we welcomed Dr. Lee Edwards of the Heritage Foundation, David King of the ACU, and Matt Lewis of Politics Daily. The panel discussed the conservative movement in the Tea Party, the odd couple or the match made in heaven. Lastly, I would like to bring to your attention a few upcoming trainings brought to you by the Department of Political Training. The first is the writing workshop on October 19th through the 20th. This is aimed at conservatives who want to break into conservative, conservative journalism. The second training is the Foreign Service Opportunity School on November 8th through the 10th. This school helps students master the Foreign Service exam and begin their career in the Foreign Service. And lastly, the Civil Service Opportunity School on November 8th through the 9th teaches students what it takes to get a job and be successful in the civil service realm. If you would like more information on any of these schools, please feel free to visit our website or consult me after the breakfast. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your morning. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, my numbers on graduates were a little more current than Tyler. Tyler's. It is over. 7,000 this year, and it is, the grand total now is over 90,000. Um, and now, uh, to introduce our speaker, and I must pause to tell you that our speaker is one of my favorite people in the whole world. Um, uh, our, uh, the introduction will be by Lauren Hart. Um, uh, Lauren is the recruitment department intern currently at the Leadership Institute. She holds master's degrees in international relations and public relations from Syracuse University. She graduated from Abilene Christian University in 2007 with a BS in integrated marketing communication. Lauren, come up here and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Morton. Good morning. Um, thank you. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Kellyanne Conway. Ms. Conway has had an amazing career spanning over 14 years and polling almost in all 50 states. Her primary research has counseled clients ranging from statewide and congressional political races 
to projects for trade associations and Fortune 100 companies. Ms. Conway is a prime guest commentator for Fox, CNN, MSNBC, PBS, The Washington Post, and New York Times, among many others. Ms. Conway has been named one of the most powerful women in politics by the Ladies Home Journal and named by the National Journal as one of Washington's most influential conservatives aged 40 or younger. Currently, Ms. Conway is CEO and president of the polling company and Women Trend a full-service market research, public affairs, and political consulting firm with offices in New York City and here in Washington. Please welcome Ms. Kellyanne Conway. Thank you so much, Lauren, and for taking good care of me today also, and for dressing like a grown-up, as everyone at Leadership Institute does. I really have to say how nice it is to see young people dressing like grown-ups. There are a lot of people, particularly on TV today, conservatives who look like they're going to cocktail hour in the middle of February in a snowstorm. So I think if you want to play the part, you ought to begin by looking the part. And I really appreciate always coming here and seeing um, shoulders covered. Speaking of first ladies who cover their shoulders, I've got to acknowledge Helen Blackwell, the first lady of the Leadership Institute, whom I just adore and who, of course, has been Morton's uh, life partner, but also the doyen of the Leadership Institute. And uh, I just think she's terrific. She's so active in Arlington County, whether it's hammering those signs in the yard, yes, 85 pounds worth of hammering signs in the yards, believe me, <laughs> putting stickers on the bumpers, um, and certainly heading up the local women's Republican groups as well. And I see her everywhere across the country where there's a conservative cause to be fought. There she is. And uh, of course, Morton Blackwell, I can say unequivocally because I say it when I'm not at the Leadership Institute, there is no one, no one who has done more to recruit, uncover, mentor, train, advocate, and help flourish a young conservatives all across this country, bar none. Thank you, Morton, very much. I just have a minor correction, Lauren, um, and thank you for not telling anybody I'm a lawyer because then they don't like me as much. It's bad enough I'm a pollster, but I am a fully recovered attorney, 12-step program. I'm married to an attorney, and George and I, uh, I, he got the short end of the stick, George and I have decided, although we abhor quotas of any type, the one quota that works for our household is one lawyer per family. <laughs> Seems to be just plenty to keep the household happy. I no longer go on MSNBC. I stopped doing that several years ago. Actually, I was just sit, sitting there one day, and I decided, if the Lord takes me too young in my life, um, I don't want to regret spending another minute at MSNBC. <laughs> um, and so I don't. But, uh, and I feel good about it. Anyhow, um, I've got a pollster really should never come without a little dog and pony show. So I put together some slides for you this morning. There are 60 here, but I'm only going to go through about 15 so that we're not just staring at the screen. And I won't repeat what's on the slide. You'll be able to read it. And I, I want to add to the slide as I speak. But I do think there are data worth seeing in graphical or chart form to really try to crystallize and quantify what's happened in the last couple of years, uh, what is happening as I stand before you, and what's likely to happen in the next four weeks, certainly, uh, minus one day, uh, and then certainly what's to happen in the next two years. I call this 2012 a new era for conservatives, not because I want to focus on the presidential contest. I've actually been very firm about not speaking about 2012 in terms of the presidential contest because we really all need to focus on 2010, and by God, everybody has. But I think just to show that this 2010 is not going to be an aberration, I actually think it's um, what they call in baseball a rebuilding year a transitional year. I think 2008 was an aberrational year <laughs> for many ways, beginning in a place here like the Commonwealth of Virginia. I think Virginia just you know, sort of lost its marbles in 2008, and in 2009 it's already on its way back. And that's uh, 2008 is the aberration. So let me, um, let me start. Oh, I think I've got one of these fancy clickers, terrific. Or no, or see, I'm showing my age. Let's see. Ah, no, that's the last slide. I'm sorry. It's up here. What I want is, oh, well, it's there. Can you just make it a full screen? Thank you. So I'm gonna, I want you 
first show you what I call the changing focus. I think this really does tell the tale of what's happened since the two years when Barack Obama was elected. 2008, the problem with the 2008 election was the coverage and even the conversation, including among many conservatives, I must say, was all about individuals. Oh, would we have the first black president, the first woman president, the first woman vice president, the first Mormon president, the oldest president? That, that's like talking about identity politics. Why do we get trapped in those conversations? What's the difference, by the way? We're supposed to care about what people say, not who they are, um, meaning what they look like or um, you know, who they, <coughs> making history. And so I, So I'm going to, you know what, does this come off? Yes. Okay. Great. All right, I'm going to do this. No, not at all. I'll do this if that's okay. Okay, so all about individuals. 2009 marked a transition almost immediately away from individuals and back onto issues. And we have Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi mainly to thank for that. They insisted on bailouts, spending, reversing Mexico City policy three days into his administration, the day after the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. It was so Im urgently important that we all f start funding abortions internationally that he did that three days in. So we focused back on issues chronic joblessness, unemployment, and if bailouts and spending were the tip of the iceberg, health care reform was the tipping point for many Americans in terms of saying, no, 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 I've had enough. This is not the role of the federal government. That price tag is too high. And have you not seen the polls, Mr. President? A majority of Americans are against this, are against what you're doing. But they've barreled through. 2010 has been a continuation away from individuals onto issues and also overlaid with independence. That started really in 2009 with the independence when Chris Christie in New Jersey and Bob McDonnell here in Virginia both carried independence handily and Barack Obama had carried independence just a year before in those respective states. And the independents are everybody from the Tea Partiers, no doubt, but there are also some disgruntled Democrats and not the ones who think that health care would have been better with a public option. But the so-called blue dogs or the conservative Democrats, even the Reagan Democrats who are still left, people who say, well, I don't recognize my Democratic Party. I don't recognize the, the issues matrix, the priority, the wish list. I certainly don't recognize the leadership. And then you've got disenfranchised Republicans. These were mainly um, conservatives who were very upset with the spending that went on in the Bush administration and, uh, and some of the other policies that had happened with a Congress that certainly didn't just lose its majority but had lost its way. I want to show you what I call the early twinings of the Tea Party movement. This is, um, the, this is 2006. These show you the 30 congressional seat losses by the Republican Party in 2006. And I know some of the wizards like to say to this moment that uh, we lost in 2006 because of Mark Foley and Bob Ney and Duke Cunningham. Now, I'm fairly sure that we lost Mark Foley's seat because of Mark Foley. We likely lost Bob Ney's seat because of Bob Ney. We actually didn't lose Duke Cunningham's seat. Uh, Bill Bray, uh, Brian Bilbray won it. But the point is, how do you explain the other losses? That's all about ethics. If we really do believe that, then we didn't get the joke and the memo that it was about spending. We had about 7 million conservative voters who should have and would have voted, and certainly could have voted, in 2006 who sat it out because they were frustrated, if not disgusted. So look at the geographic. I show you this just to show you the geographic diversity, the disparateness of those losses. Um, and the ideological, if I just mention a couple uh, members to you who lost that year, you'll recognize immediately the ideological diversity. You've got Jim Leach in Iowa, Sue Kelly, who voted against a ban on partial birth abortion in New York, Clay Shaw in Florida, J.D. Hayworth in Arizona, Gil Gutnick in Minnesota, you know, just a few that come to mind. A very, very different members, very different voting records. They, they didn't fall because of Mark Foley and Bob Ney. And how do we know that? Because... Got 24, 25 more losses two years later um, when Bob Nagg was already in prison, or Duke Cunningham certainly was, and Mark Foley was not to be seen. The red ones are the couple of seats that we won back. 
But look at the losses in blue. So those are 55 seats over two election cycles. Well, we had a Republican president in office. This is something we need to understand if we're going to get the majority back. We need to understand as a movement that our people understand they're financially sophisticated and they will pay attention to spending. You've probably seen a lot <clears throat> of talk about or you've, re you've read articles about the 34 Republicans who won in the House in districts that Obama also won in 2008. And then there, of course, was even a higher number 49 Democrats who won in districts carried by John McCain. Now, those 49 Democrats are imperiled, not all of them, but many of them are imperiled. A number of them voted against health care reform, um, and a number of them, a couple of them voted against cap and trade. But the, the key is the last one that you don't hear much about. There are 25 Democrats who won congressional districts in 2008, as did Obama, but Bush had carried those CDs in both 2000 and 2004. Now, this, is the, this kind of bullet is what led James Carville to say, we're going to have a Democratic realignment for the next 40 years. And it leads me to tell you, this kind of bullet shows you how aberrational 2008 may have been in plenty of these districts. In those tw of those 25, only three voted against health care reform. And are they ruining that vote? Um, there's even an article in today's Politico by Josh Gerstein, this morning's Politico, talking about the pro-life Democrats. I think they call them anti-abortion, but the pro-life Democrats who voted for health care without the Stupak Amendment. If my name were so similar to the word stupid, I would not act that way. <laughs> <coughs> They're really desperate now. They're really, you know, they're behind by double digits, and a number of them were freshmen to boot. The generic ballot on the eve of the 1994 elections was only plus four Republican, was only plus four Republican. Um, and so that tells you something, and now it's about that. It's, it's sometimes even, it's sometimes plus four Republican. It's been as high as plus 10 Republican. When you overlay it with likely, it, high, high propensity voters and you overlay it with the enthusiasm gap, it goes into do early, low double digits. But look at 2006, to go back to that, in 2008. In 2006, it was plus 20 on the generic ballot on the eve of the election, and they ended up with, with 31, plus 31 advantage. After 2008, it was uh, close to that in a presidential year. It's a little bit different. But the actual outcome was plus 79. So this could end up being a good year uh, if everything like that holds. I did want to show you President Obama's approval rating in a couple of ways because um, everyone who are old friends of the Leadership Institute have heard me say that, talk about what I say are the unbearable lightness of approval ratings. I don't like approval ratings as a measurement because they don't mean much. Uh, they, you know, you could just shrug your shoulders. Do you approve or disapprove? Is your thumb up in the air or down? It really doesn't matter. I mean, I like to say I married the one man in this world to whom I was deeply committed, with whom I was deeply in love, not the 15 of whom I had approved over the years. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not a very deep measurement. And, uh, but it's very useful that Barack Obama's approval rating, albeit not useful, has plummeted. And I think the 44th president is actually the 44% president now. It's a pretty fixed number. It hasn't budged in about eight or nine months. And for him, it's because once people passed that Rubicon, they felt comfortable saying, you know, I just, I don't approve of the job he's doing. Really broke, fr broke through and free in a way where many people were minding their P's and Q's before that. They felt like to criticize him would be to criticize the first black president or to criticize uh, someone whom they actually had voted for, since many people did turn over and vote for him. Uh, but this approval rating is particularly alarming among people who had supported him. So in the, this column, I've got what he actually received as a proportion of the vote among these four key groups and what his approval rating is now. So among women, he got 56%. Barack Obama won women over McCain-Palin by 13 points. Just remarkable for, a, for an open seat election. Incumbents sometimes pull that off, but for an open seat election, really remarkable. He's down 13 points among them. Among 18 to 29-year-olds, down 14. Why? Well, first of all, they came out for him, but they're back on their futons or back on their moms' and dads' couches now. Uh, and unfortunately for them, they suffer from chronic joblessness with, a, with very little hope in sight. All these articles by smart economists saying, don't, don't even know when you're going to get a job. Don't even know what to tell you. They know that. Hispanics down 18 points just in terms of approval rating. 
and then independence, that's the real tale, that's the real tale of 2009, 2010, is the flight, the absolute migration away from Barack Obama and the Democratic Party among independents. Not true among moderates. Independent and moderate are, are not interchangeable terms. Moderates still lean Democratic. But independence, which is a more important measurement because there are more of them, and, and that's a more, that's a more uh, electoral driven self-identification label, meaning I consider myself an independent, but I'm going to vote. Moderates are talking about issues and they may not vote. Uh, they're moderate on issues. A uh, generic ballot, congressional outcome, 46% want Republicans in control, 43% want Democrats. But that's a big number for Republicans given the fact that 46% of the country does not call themselves Republican. It's much lower. It's about 13 points lower than that. I just want to show you the last two bullets on this slide. It really shows you some cultural, non-political measurements. Two-thirds of the country do not feel confident that, quote, life for our children's generation will be better than it has been for us. This is the first time this number has been as such um, in decades. This was, the, this was core. This was part and parcel of the American dream, that your children and your grandchildren will always do better than you, did, you had done. That's why you worked hard. That's why you saved your money. That's why, you know, you, know, you were God-fearing people who paid your taxes and your dues and um, lived, a, lived an honest life, and you would be re your children and grandchildren would be rewarded. People no longer feel that way, and another two-thirds feel, quote, America is in a state of decline. Let me just say, America is in a state of decline is a different way than a different way of expressing the same sentiment that comes out in that right direction, wrong track number that all of us pollsters use. But embedded in that wrong track number that's never covered sufficiently is people feeling there's a real moral decline in America. When the wrong track number was high during George W. Bush's administration, people right away would say, oh, it's because of the Iraq war. Now it's just as high under Obama, and people say, well, that's because of the economy and jobs. Now, that's correct, but it's only partly correct. Always embedded in there are a fair number of Americans who say, I'm really worried about the coarseness of our culture, the vulgarity, the, the fact that uh, people know who the Kardashians are and not the Supreme Court justices. I'm very concerned about the moral direction. And when we ask the question, thinking just about the economy, is the country head in the right direction or wrong track? And then the very next question is putting aside the economy for a moment, thinking of the nation's moral direction, values, and standards. Are we heading the right direction or wrong track? Then it's revealed how important um, in, in embedded in all of that social issues are and the whole, the whole um, feeling about morality. Would you say that Barack Obama shares your values or not? Yellow is no, blue is yes. And I broke it down according to a d different key group. So 54% of men say Barack Obama does not share their values. 51% of independents. 41% uh, of 18 to 34-year-olds, all of whom, pretty much 70% of whom supported him, and, uh, and on and on. And I, I love this because a journalist asked me recently, well, how do you know what people mean by values? You know, that could be anything. And, you know, you can roll your eyes when you're on the phone with someone, I guess. But uh, I have two answers to that. Number one, I did't really care what they meant. And number two, I know what they meant. And when I say I don't, <laughs> when I say I don't care what they meant, in other words, it's good enough for me that they may be thinking he doesn't share my religious beliefs or he doesn't share my view of America. He doesn't share my nervousness about all this out of control spending. He doesn't share my view of the role of government. Those are all values. Um, at, but whatever people meant, this is what they said. And it's, 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 I'm telling you, this is a huge indictment of Barack Obama for people to say that the current sitting president of the United States, when we are at two wars, and we're at wars in two different theaters abroad, and an economic war at home, for them to say the sitting president does not share their values, it's quite remarkable. Uh, so Barack Obama's been called the most pro-abortion president in America, and I have a list here only because I could fit it on one slide, of seven things that makes it so. LifeNews.com has two pages worth, single-spaced, if you ever want to refer to that. It's a very, very useful document, LifeNews.com. But it's really important for us to talk about this. You know, call to increase government funding to Planned Parenthood, stimulus for Planned Parenthood, um, wants to strip the conscience protections, two pro-abortion justices to the Supreme Court, one of which was uh, unqualified for pretty much anything except to rule on pro-abortion cases. The uh, stem cell research, Mexico City policy, all of that. Um, and then what I tell people is, uh, I, I really wanted to show you this slide because I'm going to talk about social issues too, but 
This whole, is that mine? Sorry. Voted against the Born Alive Protection Act as an Illinois state senator. This is so key, ladies and gentlemen, because unfortunately, um, this was never made an issue in the 2008 election. Not enough. There was a strategy to bring up Bill Ayers. And I would have preferred Jill Stanick to be a household name, not Bill Ayers. Jill Stanick was the nurse in Chicago who said she was pro-choice her whole life um, until she had to hold a, a baby boy who had survived an abortion. And under law in, in Illinois, she had to take him to the expiration room and wait with him until he, quote, expired. And indeed, he did. But he had survived an abortion. And as state senator, Barack Obama voted present twice, did not take a position yes or no. You have to vote yes or no. He voted present twice. And then finally voted against the, quote, Born Alive Protection Act, which would have protected babies who had survived an abortion. Uh, they could be adopted. They could go to a church. They, in other words, look at the medical care they need. And then it would be decided uh, where they can go next. Now, I, I'm the first to say here in Washington, you sometimes have legislation. It's difficult to know what the legislation means because it's, it's termed so confusingly. This was called the Born Alive Protection Act. I think it was pretty clear what it was meant to provide. And he voted against that. Ladies and gentlemen, to this moment when I tell people that, they're literally shocked. People don't know that. They don't know that, and they need to know that. That was not a youthful indiscretion. This is the way he still feels, and he's the President of the United States, and people ought to know it. I show you this mainly to show you the top one, abortion. Morally acceptable, morally wrong. 50% of Americans now say abortion is, quote, morally wrong. Um, that we've really been winning the pro-life battle for quite a few years now between religion and morality, but also science and medicine, so sonograms, fetal development, frankly, infertility among women in their 30s and 40s who are starting to have a new appreciation um, for their, quote, lack of choices and free will when they decide they want to become mothers. Uh, and, and this is, uh, you know, look at it compared to, you know, a premarital sex or gambling, embryonic stem cell research, divorce, uh, abortion is the only one that reaches 50% in terms of people saying morally wrong. The morally wrong at 50% is even more key when you consider how many Americans know someone who's had an abortion. And for them to say it's morally wrong, they had to get past the whole notion that I'm judging and demonizing someone I care about for having had this procedure. So it's a, it's a great cultural indicator more than a political one. So 70% of people in 1965 said that religion was very important to them. It's now down to 54%. And the number of people who have said not very important has gone up to 20%. It's at its high watermark right now. 20%, one in five Americans say religion is not, not, they admit not very important to them. So the secularization of society is something we need to keep an eye on. I know people like to break out Americans politically between red and blue or male and female. and. I get all that. That's important. We do it, too, for targeting. But we also have to really take a hard look at the churched and the unchurched, the religious and the non-religious. And more important than your denomination is your religiosity, the frequency with which you practice your faith, whatever it is. This is why Orthodox Jews, Evangelical Christians, church-going Catholics, and adherent, and, um, adherent Muslims all vote pretty much the same politically because of the level of religiosity. And don't buy into this notion of the, quote, Catholic vote. That would be like saying there's a woman's vote. There is no such thing as a monolith, monolith like that. What the media do is they try to get people who are self-identified Catholics who were baptized, you know, a long time ago, go to the occasional wedding and funeral, and then overlay it with their views on abortion and their voting practices and say, see, look at how many pro-choice Catholics there. Look at all these Catholics voting Democrat. Well, that's true, and I'm not taking away their religion, but the key is to look at the religiosity, the frequency of, of attendance. Uh, do you think that <clears throat> different branches of government, the President, Congress, Supreme Court, are increasing, religion is increasing its influence or losing its influence? 62% say um, losing its influence, and of them, they said it was a bad thing. In other words, people aren't saying, oh, it's losing its influence, and that's good because of separation of church and state. I think many Americans realize that separation of church and state was meant to protect the church from the state, not the other way around. <clears throat> I wanted to show you this slide and the next slide because there's something missing in both slides. Moral matters are conspicuous by their absence. This is a poll uh, done by the AP 
last month, and they asked 14 different issues. How, how important is this for you? There's nothing in here about marriage. There's nothing in here about abortion. There's nothing in here. I mean, we've got gas prices and not abortion. So think about that. Why is that? Because we know they're obsessed with writing about it. <laughs> Pick up the paper any day, click, point and click. But they're afraid of the answers they might get. And the fact that the major media and pretty much the Democratic Party have written off social issues as being important this year means they don't know what's about to happen. They don't understand how motivated values voters are. They're totally missing that. Um, they're missing national security and they're missing social issues in terms of being motivators for plenty of people who actually will vote this year. In California, you've got Carly Fiorina telling Barbara Boxer, no, you're the extremist on abortion. You're for partial birth abortion. You think sex selection abortions are okay. You're for federal funding of abortion. You're for increasing federal funding for Planned Parenthood. You are the extremist. So you see instances where it's being turned on its head. For the first time since Gallup has been asking the question, thinking 25 years from now, what will be the most important problem facing our nation for the first time since they've been asking it in 10 years, it's federal budget deficit. This just blows me away. That it wouldn't be something more, quote, concrete like education or the, right now, the economy, joblessness. Um, during Al Gore's heyday, you know, it was the environment. And for those three weeks, the Bush administration was reforming Social Security. It was Social Security. But um, now it's federal budget deficit, which really tells you something, uh, that people are doing the math. Do not underestimate the financial sophistication of the average voter this year. They have read most pages of the 2,000-page Health Care Reform Act, even if they're members of Congress have not. They can tell you chapter, verse of the stimulus, the bailouts, everything, the earmarks. I, I really think people are underestimating the financial sophistication of the average voter. Uh, people simply believed that abortion should not be part of health care reform. And this, this question was about the fact that people who already, women who already have federal government benefits, should those governments now include coverage for abortion? And uh, with the exception of, where is it? Everybody, a majority of everybody said, I oppose except liberals, and 40% still opposed. But 53% of Obama's supporters said a year after this, a year after they voted for him, I oppose that. That to me is not health care reform. I didn't sign up for that when I said I like, quote, health care reform. You see here some of these really vulnerable Democrats. Uh, we had conducted surveys in uh, 20 congressional districts on the eve of health care reform. And just to show you these, quote, swing Democrats, all of whom, with the exception of two, I would say, and some of whom have now retired, are really embattled right now. I could tell you right now some of these people will, will lose. I doubt Kathy Dalkemper in Pennsylvania 3 will win. Steve Dryhouse in Ohio is having a hard time. These people ended up voting for health care reform. And look at the way their, their, their actual voters say they are pro-life or pro-choice. I mean, it, you've got 71% of people in Ohio 6 saying, I'm pro-life, and, and their member of Congress is on the fence about what to do. They're not even listening to their own constituents. <clears throat> this is just Pennsylvania. I want to show you Pennsylvania. Barack Obama got 55% of the vote in Pennsylvania in 2008. He now has an approval rating there of 37%. 37%. Pat Toomey is up. This poll, we had him up five. Somebody had him up five. He's really up nine. I headlined a fundraiser for Pat last weekend, and he said, I'm so far ahead that I'm afraid the NRSC will take my money and give it to somebody else. <laughs> Um, I mean, that's just remarkable from the same NRIC who ran around the country looking for someone else to run because they said, Toomey can't win. Um, and now he's leading uh, a Navy guy by, uh, by d almost double digits in a place where Barack Obama carried the state 55 to 45 two sh less than two years ago. There are as many as eight congressional seats held by Democrats in Pennsylvania that are totally in play. If you get five or six of them, it's huge. Five or six just in Pennsylvania alone is humongous. Um, and a couple of these are, are freshmen, certainly. But, um, and a couple of them are long, time, long, long timers. I'm sure you recognize some of their names. I love this slide. I just added it last night. Because I started to, to look at some of our own statewide polls, and I said, huh, this is really getting to be a problem for Obama. He's, you know, in the 30s and 40s. This is, the blue is what he got in that state in 2008. The red is his approval rating in that state right now. I mean, this is just remarkable and 
unmistakable. And so when they say Barack Obama is not on the ballot this year, yes, he is. Of course he is. I mean, even in New Jersey last year, the uh, skid marks from Air Force One were still smoking at Newark Liberty International when we cast our votes for, for governor there. He had just been there, and his guy lost handily. But look at this. I mean, just incredible. And then uh, there are statewide contests. There are uh, Senate contests in all seven of these states that I'm showing you, and in a few gubernatorial contests as well. I love this slide because it really shows you, particularly showing a slide like this at the Leadership Institute where um, 90,000 people have been trained. Just incredible, Morton. God bless you. 90,000 people have been trained. Well, here's my little footnote to that training. The reason that the major media casts everything between Republicans and Democrats is because they know it's a fairer fight for their purposes. You've got about tip, tie slight advantage to Democrats in terms of people's self-identification and these include um, people who are independent, leaning Republican or Democrat. But it's not a fair fight when it's conservative versus liberal. Or liberal. We know that twice the number of Americans call themselves conservatives and call themselves liberal. That's why the liberals don't even call themselves liberals anymore. Um, they call themselves progressives. So you ought to call them liberals. Um, it really is the gift that keeps on giving. And there really is no fancy marketing, no focus groups needed here, folks. It works because it's to, people know what that means. They now know, you know, years ago people would say, oh, liberal means my right to choose and marriage equality. They know liberal now means bailouts, health care, um, health care next time with a public option, uh, on and on and on, Euro European socialism, can Canadian style stuff. But conservative is only used by the major media when they can choose the preceding adjective right-wing, Christian crazy, Tea Party going, Bush loving. They need to choose the qualifying uh, adjective that precedes conservative. But we, you need to know that people call themselves conservative. They're proud to. Uh, look at the third bullet here. 50% of Republicans are, quote, very enthusiastic, 28% of independents, 25% of Democrats. And you may say, well, I thought independents were the key this year. They are, but it takes an awful lot for independents who don't like either political party to say, I'm excited about the election. So 31% <laughs> of Americans either personally have lost a job or someone in their immediate family has. And then add to that 65% and know somebody who has lost their job. You're talking about basically every American says, I know somebody who's lost their job. Okay, so it's beyond, it's the economy stupid. It's just, you're being stupid. I mean, this is just such an obvious chronic problem in our nation's, uh, in, our, in our nation. And uh, I will always, really as a member of the uh, opposition, I will always be confounded as to why the Obama administration chased all these rabbits down the wrong rabbit holes instead of really focusing on the economy and jobs. This is the independent slide I was talking about earlier. So I, I'm showing you 2008 presidential election, 2009, um, and then of course Scott Brown and Martha Coakley in Massachusetts. 2008 in New Jersey, Obama carried independence by four points, and they are a majority of the electorate in New Jersey. He carried them by one point here in Virginia, but Chris Christie doubled that. He carried them by two to one, 60 to 30, just a year later, just a year later. And uh, Bob McDonald, same thing, two to one over Cray Deeds here in Virginia. These are just among independents. Scott Brown carried them by plus 40 for Ted Kennedy's open seat. And this is just, so, and I really want to show you this too because people can say, oh, you know, Martha Coakley was just a terrible candidate and Scott Brown is pro-choice and blah, blah, blah. Well, Chris Christie's not. And Bob McDonald's not. And um, I vote in New Jersey now. And let me tell you something. It's, it's more Corazine country than Christie country if you just look at raw uh, registration numbers and people's past behaviors. But, um, you know, folks understand what the teachers unions are doing now. They're uh, less, in, less in for the students than for themselves, it seems. And uh, people are starting to understand that. This is a, a Gallup numbers, pro-life, pro-choice over 15 years. The yellow is pro-choice, the green is pro-life. 56% of Americans in 1996 said I'm pro-choice, 33% said pro-life. It's now crisscrossed. It's gone down 11 points on pro-choice 
and it's gone up 14 on pro-life. That's a 25-point swing, and that is just huge. This is, a, this is a, supposed to be a political indicator, but it's really a cultural indicator that needs a political response. This is my whole point about exposing people for how they are. Not just, uh, certainly the most pro-abortion president, the most pro-abortion speaker of the House, and so on, but also their policies to have slipped abortion care as part of health care, to, um, to, to want to open up embryonic stem cell research when people are using skin cells and adult embryonic cells, uh, excuse me, adult cells. And uh, does anybody in this room know how many people, ha how many conditions have been ameliorated or how many lives have been saved through? Thank you, zero. This is not A-OK, -okay. this is zero. And you better get that number out there. Zero within a margin of error of plus or minus zero. I show you the actual electorate, not the adults, not registered voters, and not even the people gazing over their navels at Starbucks talking about abortion this and politics that, people who actually voted in 2000, 2004, and 2008. These are actual voters. Look at the six-point scale on election night. This is a much better way of understanding how people feel about abortion than just pro-life, pro-choice. So abortion should be prohibited in all circumstances. You do see the electorate was half as likely to say that in 2008 as 2000 when you had a more pro-life electorate. But look at what's increased. The third category should be legal in cases of rape, incest, or to save the life of the mother. Frankly, that number has gone up because of the left. The, the feminist strategy has been to try to pound everybody over the head. How could you re-victimize somebody who's just been raped or incested? And, so they make it sound like all the abortions are for that reason, when less than 1%, according to the Allen Guttmacher Institute, which is the pro-choice clearinghouse of Planned Parenthood, they say that less than one, one half of 1% are for this reason. But this has increased the number of Americans saying, here's why I'm, quote, pro-choice. I'm pro-choice because I believe somebody has been raped or incested, where in, uh, at least on Capitol Hill, those people would be considered, quote, pro-life. Um, and then look, 6%, 6% of actual voters the day Barack Obama won handily agreed with his position on abortion. The Clinton, Clinton, Gore, Kerry, Obama, Obama, Biden position. Abortion should be allowed at any time during a woman's pregnancy and for any reason. And you may say, well, then how in the world did he get elected? Back to my original point, because who knew this about him? Nobody. A couple people. They weren't going to vote for him anyway. Those, quote, independent suburban moms, they ought to know this. They really ought to know this, and I hope they know it soon. <clears throat> this is just a more updated version, but it shows you um, the difference between the two-point scale, pro-life, pro-choice, and then how it actually explodes upward when you have the nuanced um, read. I want to quickly talk about Hispanics and blacks on the issues. Um, this whole, you know, everybody gnashing their teeth and wringing their hands. How do we get more Hispanics? How do we get more black? Well, why don't we just talk to them the way we talk to everyone else? A. B. Uh, let's stop taking what I consider to be a really mediocre ad in English and translating it into Spanish. Because then we have, like, two mediocre ads. You know, say one mediocre ad, two different languages. We get them through values issues. And we certainly get them through their either current status or aspirational path towards economic upward mobility. Who doesn't want to be economically upwardly mobile? Who's not fighting to, to, to go that way? And who has not been interrupted uh, in their pursuit of the American dream these last two to three years? And so we get them through that combination. But I wanted to show you this. Um, Hispanics, <clears throat> you know, they favor, g g not favor gay marriage and civil unions, but they're much less likely to oppose it that are black Americans. But this is the key here, and this is counterintuitive to people. Hispanics whose families date back three generations are more likely to favor gay marriage by 17 points. Second generations by seven points. First generations oppose gay marriage by three points. And people, it always surprises people, but look, the longer you've been here, the more Americanized you are, the more you've listened to this, that, and the other. But this is important. The other thing that's important about Hispanics to know is there are 50,000 Hispanics who turn 18 every month in this country. 50,000, that's 600,000 a year, turn 18. One third of the U.S. Hispanic population is younger than 18. So what in God's name are we talking about? We've lost Hispanics. A third of them don't even vote yet. We're going to write them off? They haven't cast their first vote yet. We're going to say, oh, forget it. I mean, it's just, um, and I do not think we've done a very good job. I think the money has been 
really misallocated when it comes to, and really insulting, frankly, when it comes to how to reach the Hispanic vote. But <clears throat> here's how they believe on um, moral issues, and particularly abortion at the bottom. And here are black Americans, <clears throat> very much more likely to oppose gay marriage. 70% uh, of blacks voted for Proposition 8 in California, 70% on the same day that 95% of them voted for Barack Obama for president. A similar thing happened in the state of Florida. Obama won Florida, 51%. Blacks, about 60% and higher voted um, for traditional marriage. So they're able to split their tickets that way, but they're not willing to abandon their moral views for the sake of, um, for the, sake of the fact that their, their president feels that way. And here you go, Proposition 8 by race. I have your Asians. I mean, I, I, we don't have time today, but I'm really on this um, high horse about doing more to reach out to Asian Americans as a movement. It's really just criminal that we don't do a better job of this. Uh, Asian Americans, they have household incomes of over $70,000 now, highest, of course, of the four main races. After Jewish Americans, they have the highest level of intact first marriages. Um, where I live and where I used to live in Fairfax County, frankly, and many of the Koreans, Filipinos, they're, they're propping up the local churches. They're, they're who's there. They're very religious uh, sects, S-E-C-T-S, of Asian Americans. And uh, they owned small businesses. Asian American businesses grew at twice the number of all small businesses from 2000 to 2008. I mean, the statistics go on and on. But you know what people say to me? Yeah, but they're, aren't, they, aren't they just... You know, they crinkle the nose. It's always a bad sign. Crinkle the nose and put the shoulders up. Aren't they really a small percentage of the population? Um, well, they're 5% of the population. You can decide whether that's small. Uh, it, it seems to me that's what all the presidential elections have been decided on in the last, I don't know how many years. Um, number two. Number one, I don't really care what percentage of the population they are. I care that we've been losing them. In 1992, George Herbert Walker Bush lost the election but won Asian Americans by 30 points over Clinton and Perot, 30, but lost the election. 1996, Clinton wins the election, Dole carries Asians by 13 points. 2000, Bush wins the election, loses Asians by one point to that big magnet of entrepreneurship, Al Gore. You know, we started to lose Asians by one point to Al Gore. Uh, 2004, Bush wins again, John Kerry wins Asians by seven points. 2008, Barack Obama wins. He wins Asians by 33 points. Outrageous. Outrageous for a man who loves taxes and regulations and spending to be basically telling these successful entrepreneurs whose kids go to college, like you and I drink water and coffee, um, you know, who are very religious, we're with you. But we haven't done much to get them. And so, you know, to, to really make them feel like they have a hospitable home with us. And essentially, the left just says, if you're a minority, you're, you're with us because we're with you. Come on board. So I'd love for us to do much more. Now, in true, in true you got to let people define themselves. Do not assume somebody is an Asian household or a Jewish household or a Democrat. The people have to define yourself. My husband's half Filipino, and my household is about as Asian as Graceland. So, uh, <clears throat> This is the difference between the two-point scale and the six-point scale with blacks and Hispanics. So only, this is just remarkable, only 32% of blacks call themselves pro-life. They like the word pro-choice, sounds great. But look at it when we ask the six-point scale. You know, it goes down nine, it goes up seven. Hispanics, even more dramatic, plus 16 and negative 10 when you actually ask them for their positions. That's why, I mean, getting beyond the labels is not just important because we're talking about so, something so much more precious and fundamental when we're to, than, than quote pro-life or pro-choice encapsulates. But it's really important to get beyond the labels to allow people to express their views. So I have just a few more. I wanted to show you just a couple of things here um, about, this is a, a great project we just did for Priest for Life and Alveda King who calls herself a quote, 21st century freedom fighter. They're doing these, um, uh, they're doing these freedom marches. Uh, and, and they, they Priest for Life with Alveda King, who's the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King, and very pro-life, they did this, uh, what I consider to be groundbreaking research among blacks on the, on the matter of abortion and the religion and whatnot. Um, about 70% of blacks say they know somebody's had an abortion, perhaps including themselves, um, or, the, or the women in their lives. And uh, we asked them about the, quote, quality of experience, you know, to people. But this is what's really remarkable. 
I'm going to show you this. 34% knew Barack Obama's pro-choice. 18% said he's pro-life. Only 6% of black Americans said that his view is, quote, abortion should be allowed at any time, any reason during a woman's pregnancy, which is true. It's not a, it's not a, a talking point. That's just true. And he's proud of it. 48% of blacks said, I don't know. I don't know. Now, you could say, well, why don't they know? They don't know because we don't tell them what they need to know. They ought to know. Earlier in the survey, we don't have time today, but earlier in the survey, and the, the slide was here, three slides up, um, so many of them said that they rarely hear about abortion from religious leaders, and that's important. 37% of blacks knew the Democratic Party's official platform is pro-choice. 16% said it was pro-life, which means they are pro-life and they are Democratic, so they assume the Democratic Party is pro-life. Same thing about Obama. 48% said, I have no idea what it is. 73% um, support parental notification laws. Um, and then look at this, the, the last column, what I was talking about, the Born Alive Infant Act. Two thirds of blacks said, I have no idea if that's true. 18% uh, said it's false. And 16%. So it's just a, a good example of how, you know, we are armed with facts that actually could be useful. So just a few more. Um, smaller is better to Americans. Uh, I'll show you this one. This is the famous Gallup survey on institutions. Small business was the number two after the military in terms of which institutions do you have the most faith in. Uh, look at where <clears throat> Congress is. They don't get much lower. It's down from 18% 18, uh, 18 in March of 1994. Organized labor, that has to be the next big initiative, frankly, is to go right after organized labor and expose what they're doing to <coughs> America's workers and schools on television news, haha. But even the United States Supreme Court is down by 15 points in a year. Even the, um, excuse me, the presidency is down 15% in a year. The Supreme Court is down four points. The presidency, you could say it's coincidence or you can say it's causation. But it, the presidency and how much you respect the presidency is down 15% in one year um, with Obama in it. But this two-thirds saying, I um, have a great deal of trust in small businesses, a great deal or a lot of trust in small businesses, we're really missing this as well. Entrepreneurs do not necessarily vote conservative or vote Republican. Um, and again, they're not a very organized group. You could say, well, the chamber, NFIB, I get that. But they're really just, in, you know, they're instructing people onto policies and, and what's happening. But to really organize small businesses, these are the folks, by and large, showing up at Tea Party rallies. Small businesses, all this nonsense that it's a bunch of angry banshees with curly toenails and long hair and no front teeth headed for the hills. That's a stereotype and a caricature made by the mainstream media. A lot of them are shopkeepers who literally turn the sign, be back in an hour, to go over to that Tea Party rally or that town, that town hall um, health care meeting. <clears throat> who or what is the Tea Party? Uh, it's um, about 10 points more male than female. It's uh, fairly educated. It's uh, independent slash Republican. Um, independence really important here, and they're conservative. They're probably about 20 points more conservative than the country says they are. But what do they believe? Here, are all adults versus Tea Party on immigration, bailout, that Obama has increased taxes. I mean, by two to one, the Tea Party says Obama has increased taxes. You've got the social issues in the middle there. Um, by two and a half to one, quote, Obama has expanded the role of government in addressing economic problems. By almost two to one, prefer a smaller government with fewer services. So this is what the Tea Party believes. Immigration's an important issue to them as well. The Constitution is very important to them. I love this, because this just came out last week, Wall Street Journal poll. I love this because it shows what we've known for a long time. And we had polling back in April, but I wanted to show you a more recent snapshot of this. 20% of the Tea Party movement says that they support the Tea Party movement, quote, to protest the performance of the Obama administration. So I think the president and Robert Gibbs should stop unnecessarily flattering themselves that the Tea Party is in direct response to Obama. That's a fifth of it. But 42% say, I'm protesting business as usual in Washington. This is really about Washington, everybody here, uh, pretty much, not just Obama. Um, and it's good. It's frankly good that it's not a sheer anti-Obama movement. Um, and look, 33% say the Tea Party has just enough influence, 30% too much, 18% too little influence on the GOP. 
And let's face it, the Tea Party is a movement. It's a philosophy. It is unorganized but not disorganized. And that's its key. And, you know, just as recently as last week in New York, of course, I attended a dinner where Governor Mitch Daniels was the guest, and there was discussion about the Tea Party. He talked about the Tea Party in Indiana, but there were two journalists there in New York, and one, you know, these are conservative journalists, and one said, but isn't the Tea Party really just the Perot people 18 years later? I mean, it's just confounding to me that you can actually think that. No is the most polite way I can answer the question. Um, uh, one big distinction I see is there's no Ross Perot this time, and there's no chief leader, and that's a good thing. Just as I think there's no primary leader of the Republican Party right now, there's no leader of the Tea Party movement. That's good because it means the people are the leaders. It means that, um, you know, it means that it's a true grassroots bottom-up movement instead of being top-down. And listen, when you don't have the White House, the benefit is that you have one core message, limited government, whether it's in spending or taxation or values, you have one core message, limited government, and you have a gazillion messengers. When you have the White House, you have one messenger, and that's why you flail around as they are right now with a multitude of different messages, seeing what's going to stick. <clears throat> what did the Tea Party, you know, what's acceptable or unacceptable? President Obama has dealt a major setback. For, the people are split. 41% actually think that would be a good thing. Tea Party influences the Republican Party to become more conservative. 50% say acceptable. Back to my original slides on the early twinings of the Tea Party, losing overspending in those other issues. Um, 2006 was about sending a message. These were those 7 million what I call conscientious objectors. You know, people who did not vote, not because they don't pay attention to politics, but because they do. And they sat it out really uh, in a very punitive way against a, an out-of-control spending Republicans. 2010, though, you know, sending a message ended up being very costly. It cost us a lot of money, and it got us Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi, and Harry Reid. So instead of sending a message, we have to elect conservatives. This is what we're doing in 2010. This is what's really important. And I have to tell you, I predict a very, very good outcome on November 2nd. I think the Senate is totally within reach. I also think it only matters a little bit. If we get it, meaning um, there would be no governing majority for the Democratic Party on nearly anything. If they couldn't pass some of this stuff, you know, card check was supposed to be HR1 and SR1. Card check is not the law right now. There are still secret ballot elections um, for union organization. Uh, there, and I, I can give you a list of five things that were supposed to be the first thing passed in January of 2009 that still are not. And I don't see how can they pass in lame duck unless you've got some of these people who, are, who have already lost their primaries, including in the Senate, who want their big legacy to be I appropriated X amount of dollars or I went out, you know, my swan song was helping the Democrats pass X. And I would hope, you know, Arlen Specter or, or Senator Bennett in Utah don't do that. But um, I don't see how they can pass stuff that they couldn't get. You know, one of the most, one of the immediate byproducts of Lisa Murkowski and Mike Castle losing their primaries was Olympia Snow and Susan Collins voting against the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I absolutely don't think that was a coincidence. They voted with John McCain on those issues. They deferred to him and not to Lady Gaga, who famously went to Maine asking for their votes. So that's a good sign when we're still listening to Senator McCain on military issues and not Lady Gaga. This is good. Um, there is hope. But, uh, you know, we just, I think more importantly than the bean counting, how many do we end up with, the quality, the quality of the incoming class, the men and women I have met across this country who are running for Congress this year and Senate. It's really just great. The people who have sailed through these primaries in an anti-establishment year where the establishments, um, the establishment favored picks because they had high name ID and deep pockets got turned on their heads in at least seven, if not eight, of the Senate contests alone. This is good, and please don't buy into the nonsense. The three most poisonous words, three most poisonous words for the conservative movement are you can't win. This nonsense of he can't win, she can't win. And please don't start saying it about 2012. Oh, can so-and-so beat Barack Obama? Don't even ask the question. Answer it and say, so-and-so can beat Barack Obama. And you know what? It does matter who so-and-so is. There's no question it will matter who so-and-so is. But right now it doesn't, meaning the, the, I, the, the action has to be on, of course Barack Obama is going to lose. He's done this and this and this and this and this. 
He has, he has totally robbed our children and grandchildren of their rightful futures. He has spent money that we don't have. He's exploded the deficits. His priorities have been wrong. They haven't created or stimulated much of anything except more government. And you have to go on and on and on with the list. Of course he can be beaten. But these three poisonous words, you can't win. Voters, this has been my dream election because I've been saying for years, you can't win becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And uh, ask President Rudy Giuliani or President Hillary Clinton how it turns out when everybody says at the beginning, you can win. You can win. I'm going to support you because you can win. Well, why do you think they can win? They're high in the polls. I know. Why are they so high in the polls? Everybody thinks they can win. So they, they've said, so they're high in the polls. Plus, they're raising money. Now, how are they raising all that money? They're high in the polls. Everybody thinks they can win. They wrote them a check. But, you know, voters have their say. That's the key. That hearing that Michael Castle can't lose, Lisa Murkowski's a shoe in Trey Grayson in Kentucky, you know, the, uh, the list goes on and on. Nevada, Colorado, all the, uh, all the preferred establishment favorites. Many of them lost because voters don't ask themselves who can win. Voters ask themselves who can lead. And their definition of leadership is different than this fiction of electability. So we cannot give in to this, I, you know, I like so-and-so, but I don't think so-and-so can win this year. And the most remarkable thing to me is, uh, even in the case of Christine O'Donnell in Delaware, she just won five minutes ago. She just won five minutes ago by six points, and people are on the TV saying, I don't think she can win. I mean, think of how ridiculous that sounds. She just won. I don't think she can win. So, I mean, the, the, once in a while, we actually have to listen to ourselves. And, uh, and the, I just, please do not subscribe to those words. I think it's, um, it's really very key. The other thing we have going for ourselves, and this is really ironic for Barack Obama, who carried on the tradition of the presidential candidate who was seen as the most optimistic won. It's happened every time in the last 40 years except one election. Um, you're probably wondering which one, 1972, but the person who was seen as more optimistic by the voters uh, has won every time. We look more optimistic now. The other side looks like they're sucking on a dozen lemons. They're always so dour and sour about everything. We sound really optimistic, and we need to. Because you know what? People don't want you to say what I just said, generational theft, and, you know, we're going to cut things to the bone. We're going to do that. But we need to sound happy about it. We need to say why that's an important and optimistic and hopeful hopeful way of approaching things. And I think if we actually not just take away the approval rating and the momentum and the money race and all of that away from the left, but also the optimism that somehow they were able to reclaim the last two to four years, then we will have, I think, a real conservative realignment um, for the next uh, however many years or decades. Thank you very much. Time for questions. I know people have to go to their jobs. Any time for questions? Yes, sir. Great, Morton. Thank you. Guy, yes, sir. The guy you referred to is Carl Rove. Talking about well, it's not just Carl. I actually wasn't thinking of just Carl, but Carl, um, I'm thinking of many people, but Carl retracted uh, what he said, or I should say softened it um, a couple nights later on the same show on Hannity. Because um, I think he got a lot of hue and cry from Fox News viewers, if not from other people. Um, well, you know, once you've been part of the establishment, it's very difficult to think the establishment is actually not going to have, you know, a good night. But uh, the other thing is we, you know, we as Republicans have not been competitive in, in Delaware statewide in a very long time. And so I think people don't understand the electorate as well as they need to. And, um, and I, I have to say, as somebody who never complains about, you know, oh, so-and-so treats me unfairly because I'm a woman and blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't believe in identity politics. I just don't. I'm really happy that there are so many pro-life women running this time. I'm really happy there are so many fiscally conservative women running this time. But it also wouldn't matter to me if they were men. You know, I just, I, I, I care about what you think, not what you, I, I care that you share my positions and my values, not my gender. But I do have to say, and this, again, is not Carl specific, I do have to say that there is, you know, we still feel uncomfortable. There's still some growing pains about the way conservative women are covered by the media, including some of our own people in the media. Um, there's this temptation to talk about hairdos and husbands and haute couture. You know, I never, I never read these stories about the paunchy 
beer bellies and bad comb overs in Congress. And there are plenty. Again, not thinking of anyone specifically, because there are plenty. But we still seem uncomfortable or, or out of sorts. Maybe not uncomfortable, but just it's just unusual to have so many women um, who are running and running as pro-lifers. And I think if Christi there's definitely a path for victory for Christine O'Donnell. And in full disclosure, we're helping her campaign. But there's a path. And I'm helping her campaign because I believe there is a path to victory. Her opponent is a total dud and a total reliable vote for this agenda. Folks, just like with Sharon Angle in Nevada, the same thing with Christine O'Donnell in Delaware. All you need to know is who their opponent is. And you really don't have to say anything else. People say, can Sharon Angle win? Well, of course, but can we please talk about her opponent is Harry Reid. You should be doing everything that you can. You should be doing your level best to get Harry Reid the heck out of there. You owe it to Nevadans. You owe it to America. Um, but no, people should not be saying that, but I'm telling you, the left always says, including with Barack Obama, we can win. We can win. Here's how we're going to do it. We sometimes can't get past that first threshold of can we really win, and we crinkle our nose, and frankly, at the presidential level, we end up always going with the next in line because we're so fearful that only the next in line can win, and they really haven't been winning, you know, in the last 20 years that well. One more? One more? Yes, sir. Joe Diaguardi in New York, the original piece of work I told him last week, I've always referred to him. He was a great member of Congress, very conservative, um, served in the Congress in the 1980s, came back to primary Sue Kelly in 1996 after the Republicans won the majority, and, and now uh, was the surprise winner of the Republican primary, and he had the conservative line, which is very important in New York, and, uh, and now he's a nominee against very unknown Kirsten Gillibrand. She is winning that race by virtue of the fact that if your primary is in September, it's very difficult to do the retail politicking that, that Joe really excels at all across New York. But nobody's going to work harder this cycle than Joe Diaguardi. He's everywhere all the time. He likes to remind people, too, his daughter is Cara Diaguardi, who just ended up, he just left as the um, judge of American Idol. He likes telling people that to get the youth vote. The thing about, there again, Kirsten Gillibrand is vulnerable because she's unremarkable. You can't, you know, I've seen these polling where, and we had done two polls for people who wanted to run against her and ended up not running for that seat. The real problem with that seat, sir, is you've got to run this year, and then you've got to run again in two years. And very, very few people wanted to run two times in a row because she was appointed. This was Hillary Clinton's seat. What Joe needs to do, frankly, in addition to what he's doing, is to remind people that not a single New Yorker, not a single New Yorker, has gotten a job because of Kirsten Gillibrand, but Kirsten Gillibrand got her job because of David Patterson. This corrupt, incompetent governor appointed her after Caroline Kennedy famously said, uh, 128 times in a New York Times interview. I mean, for the New York Times to reveal the uh problem among Harvard-educated uh Caroline Kennedy was remarkable. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I, didn't go, I didn't go to Harvard, and I'm not a Kennedy. <laughs> so... We need, to be, we need to remind New Yorkers that she got her job because of David Patterson. He put her there. And I think New York is totally in play. There's no reason why it wouldn't be. New York is like the rest of the country in California, frankly. It's broke. It's embarrassing. Small biz businesses are fleeing the state. Taxpayers fleeing the state. Joe Diaguardi will do very well upstate New York. You asked about upstate. He'll do very well upstate New York. That The trick is those suburbs in Westchester County, Orange County, Putnam County, that's really where the, the race will be won or lost. But Quinnipiac showed him within, six, w within a few points. It's probably a little bit more in her favor. But they're worried. Kirsten Gillibrand has never been above 50% the entire race. That's key. Yeah. Okay, thank you all so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to get in as it was to get out. Um, well, uh, thank you so much, Kelly. I really appreciate it. Uh, I knew you would uh, give us a lot of food for thought in the coming elections. It's my pleasure uh, to present to you as a token of our uh, appreciation, a Leadership Institute Adam oh, Smith beautiful. scarf. I love it. Great. Kelly Green, I love it. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, the um, what is is it on? Is it working? It's still gone. Okay. Um, the uh, couple of things that I'd like to uh, to point out. Actually, more than more than one. Y you don't know this, most of you, but Sharon Angle is a graduate of the Leadership Institute and sent many of our people, her people, for, to us to be trained. Christine O'Donnell is a graduate of the Leadership Institute, sent many of her people uh, to us to be trained. The campaign manager for Joe Miller, who beat Lisa Murkowski in uh, the Alaska primary, uh, Joe Miller's campaign manager early this year attended our week-long campaign manager school. Campaign manager for Rand Paul uh, in Kentucky has attended nine different Leadership Institute schools and uh, worked for us uh, for a time in, in years past. Uh, the uh, Republican nominee, Mr. Racy, for the U.S. Senate uh, in West Virginia, who in recent days has incredibly shown up in the polls as leading for the Senate race, he came here for training uh, in, in our studios at our Effective TV Techniques operation. A great numbers of these people. I, c I could uh, go on, and we started the house races. Uh, we'd, uh, it, would it would take longer than we have. But I truly appreciate the support that we have been getting. Our staff has been working like sons of guns, uh, and it's made possible by our donors. But uh, this programmatically has been the most intense year that the Institute has ever undertaken. Before we uh, leave, I want to uh, take an opportunity uh, to thank our Director of Events, Mary Kane, uh, for her work here at the Institute. Mary has accepted a position uh, at a division of Analytical Services, Inc. called ANSWER. And this is not Mary's last day at the Leadership Institute, but this is her last Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast as a staffer. I hope she'll come back to Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast in the future. I would ask you to uh, join me in wishing Mary the very best in her new position and career. Mary, are you here? Is she in the room? There she is. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. I invite you to uh, join us on Wednesday, November 10th. Notice it isn't going to be the first Wednesday because we are going to have in this room a Tuesday night uh, election party to which you are all invited. And it's going to be a big shindig. And uh, uh, we thought about it and thought about it and, sh and realized it was actually physically possible to get this place cleaned out and set up again. Uh, so we, we, we could do that. But then I realized I'm going to have to chair the luncheon. And I don't know if bright and early uh, to, uh, Wednesday morning, I'm going to be in shape to chair the luncheon. And probably uh, I would not be unique in that regard. So we will have our Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast on the second Wednesday. Our speaker will be Dick Patton, who is president of the American Family Business Institute. And, uh, and I know you will enjoy what he has to say. He, his, he has been very active politically which is one of the reasons he's invited now. I would invite anyone interested in a tour of the Institute to meet Whitney Strang here at the lectern after the breakfast. Whitney, where are you? There's Whitney, and, uh, and she'd be happy to give you a tour. Thank you very much.